Hey, it's Haley, and welcome to another bookish video. Today, I'm going to be ranking, not just ranking, hello, tier ranking every single horror trope or like cliche thing that shows up in a horror book or a horror movie. I freaking love horror. I read a lot of different horror, all different types, all the way from extreme horror, like crazy shit that I can't even talk about on YouTube without being demonetized to YA horror. So everything in between is going to be on this list and I'm going to give you the breakdown of the things that I love and the things that I hate and hopefully I will learn a little bit about my horror reading taste in this video. Okay I'm starting my screen recording but like it looks like I'm wearing a robe. I swear to god I am not wearing like a Victoria's Secret sexy robe right now. <laughs> I'm wearing just a silk shirt, but it literally looks a little crazy. So ignore that, please. Let's go ahead and get into the ranking. So first, let me go over the categories I have here. The top tier is going to be my auto buy tier. So auto buy basically means if I hear this element is in this book, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to add it to cart. Like my shopping addiction is really going to kick into full gear and I'm not going to be able to say no. The second tier is a book that pulls me in. If I know that this element is in this book, I'm gonna be intrigued, I'm gonna add it to my TBR. The middle category is it depends on the use. It depends on how this trope is used, if I'm going to enjoy it or not. The fourth tier down is the opposite of pulls me in, it pushes me away. So it's something that if I know it's in a horror book, I'm going to move it down my TBR, maybe not add it to my TBR. And the last category is literally die for the books that I literally think should die. Okay, Fahrenheit 451 that shit. It's done, it's not good, I'm not gonna waste my time. So I have 30 horror elements, tropes, etc. down here that I came up with. These are all from my brain. So I don't want to hear any comments from any Reddit horror incel boys that are like, that's not a trope. Okay, these are just from my little pea brain. So let me live my life. If you want to think I'm just a dummy dumb woman who doesn't know what a trope is, that's fine. But for me, these are the horror tropes that I've chosen to rank today. The first one, we're going to start with a good class. And that's an evil doll. Oh, uh, whoa. We're moving you all the way up here to auto buy. If I know there's a little doll who haunts people, slashes people, or anything in between, I'm in. I'm down. You don't have to tell me twice. Evil dolls are everything to me. If you know me, you know the Chucky series is my favorite franchise of all time. It is my favorite horror anything ever. And it was also the first horror movie that I ever watched. So that is where my love for horror started with an evil doll. I will insert a picture of me dressed as Tiffany Valentine from the Chucky series for Halloween this year. And you can just see how much I love her because I want to be her without the murdering, obviously. Uh, but yeah, that's an auto buy. Next up, we have demonic possession. This is something that definitely pulls me in. I love a good possession story. I think it's a lot more exciting than a regular old haunting. It adds that element of like someone's life is at risk rather than just like it's a chair that moved across the room between when you went to bed and when you woke up in the morning. That to me is just not giving exciting. <laughs> and demonic possession definitely is. I also like the religious elements and like the occult kind of elements that can come in when we deal with a demonic possession story. Next up, okay, so this is an actual like trope that can be found commonly in horror movies and horror books, and that is finding an old artifact, like the amulet in the Child's Play series, or like an old book, like in the Evil Dead, something old and mysterious that has some dark magic or something attached to it that either haunts you or makes you the target of something. This one, I think it depends on the use because this one can get problematic. Let's just be honest. If the lore around the artifact is rooted in hateful, racist, uh, horrible stuff, then obviously this trope is gonna go wrong 
home really quick, but I think it can also be a really interesting element to the story. It can add that speculative element, and y'all know I love speculative shit in my horror. The next trope is the weapon is just out of reach. Okay, this one. <laughs> this one, uh, it depends on the use. Again, I have read books where you get to the climax and it's so exciting and the weapon is just out of our hero's hand and he just can't reach it to stab and kill the person who's on top of him. And that creates such, such tension in the book. It's like that moment where you're looking at the screen going, no, no, no. But I've also seen this used as a device to just like prolong a struggle or like a fight sequence. And I don't like when it's used in that way. So it truly does depend in this instance. The next trope is all the lights going out. And for me, this pushes me away. Um, mostly in a movie sense. Like I cannot stand it when there are such dark scenes in a movie where I'm literally... Okay, listen, I have bad eyes. Like I can't, if I can't parse out what's happening on my TV screen from 10 feet away, girl, come on, Miss Cinephotography. Let's, let's pump it up a little bit. <laughs> In a book, I really don't think the lights going out adds anything. Maybe if our character is like touching something in the dark to figure out what it is and it's something scary, that could be entertaining and effective horror. But mostly when the lights go out, it's not effective for me. Ooh, a critical item is lost. Okay, this one definitely pulls me in. I love when a critical item is lost by our main character. Like they get to the car and they're about to escape and then they don't have the keys or the the car won't start or they are running to go get help and they don't have a flashlight or a way to get attention and the car just drives right past them when somebody loses a phone a charger I feel like that just further isolates our main character and heightens the horror the next one is kind of like a broad category of horror and that is psychological horror and that is a draw for me for sure it definitely pulls me in I love psychological horror I love when you can terrify me without bringing in all of the blood and guts although I do love blood and guts Psychological horror is just very special, especially extreme psychological horror. Those are some of my favorite things to read. Nature's revenge depends on the use for me. I really like when it's something like the ruins where the actual landscape is the horror. Nature's coming to take back what us despicable humans took from them or ruined for the trees or the creatures that are living in this place. I do like that, but it depends. Sometimes it can be really boring. And especially in book form, I find that Nature's Revenge is, is really hard to read and to, to actually picture in your mind. But The Ruins, I think, does it really well. Obviously, The Ruins by Scott Smith. I think that's going to be lauded as a modern horror classic. And also, They Were Here Before Us by Eric Loraka. Y'all know I love Eric Loraka. This is his newest release. And it's all about this kind of they were here before us. Nature was here on this planet before we were, and they're getting their revenge. I love, love that collection of short stories. Highly recommend it. Next up, we have Body Horror. And this is another one where I'm going to give you a lengthy explanation <laughs> because it really does depend on the use. I love body horror that talks about blood and guts, okay? If we're just describing viscera, I am on board. Tell me about those steaming intestines. But I do not like specific body horror that has to do with like bodily functions. Like I cows... Cows by Matthew Stucco. Yeah, I will see myself out. Anything that has to do with vomit, shit, bile, I'm just like not into that. But blood and guts, I can totally handle. Extreme gore, come on, come on. That's an auto buy. If I hear that a book has the most extreme crazy gore that no one's ever read before or the most 
crazy insane movie with the craziest score that's gonna make me literally terrified to shut my eyes I am gonna want that yeah I love extreme gore that in the 80s this is a huge trend that I'm seeing specifically in horror books but also in movies as well is a lot of inspiration from the 80s I think a lot of our classic horror that is my favorite and a lot of horror lovers favorites was in the 80s coming out in the 80s or set there so I I'm seeing a lot of horror come out that is set in the 80s and it just has that like vintage nostalgic feel. I'm obsessed with it. Uh, it's an auto buy. Something like My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix. Gosh, I just love the vibes. Oh, the next one is great too. And that is the kid doesn't realize it's a ghost or it's a possession or whatever. A kid thinking that something is totally normal while all the adults around them are freaking out is one of my favorite tropes in horror. It obviously happens in Chucky with Andy Barclay at the beginning when he doesn't understand that Chucky is possessed by a serial killer. It happens in something like The Sixth Sense or insidious. Ugh, I just love movies like that. Some of my favorite horror movies have this trope and books as well. I think this can be really easily transferred over to a horror book. Ooh, the next element we have is the hero dies at the end. Ugh, this is hard. This is really hard. I think I'm gonna put it in pushes me away because I think this can work. And in one of my favorite horror books of all time, which I won't give away which one this is, no spoilers, the hero does die. But for me, I think it worked in that sense. And I, I would put it in depends on the use, but I know that immediately if I read our main character's death, I'm gonna think, oh, I wanna lower my rating. Like immediately is gonna push me away from enjoying the book if the person I've been rooting for the entire time dies. It's gonna feel like the whole story, their entire narrative was a waste. Ooh, the next one is no service. Right at that critical moment, the telephone wire is cut or you're in an isolated setting with no cell phone service. And that definitely pulls me in. Really similar to like the critical item being lost. I think it just heightens the horror for me. Ooh, I love the next one too. Y'all, I just love horror. <laughs> The camp or cabin setting, that's an auto buy. That's an auto buy for me. Camp slaughter, chef's kiss, most perfect setting I've ever read for a slasher. Something like The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager. Oh my God, I just love that. You can't get more classic than Friday the 13th. Death to the Fornicators. Oh my god, I love this trope. This is one that definitely pulls me in. I don't think it's an auto buy because obviously that wouldn't be advertised. Like, hey, you know, the people that go off off screen to fuck, yeah, they die. Nobody's gonna say that about a book in their review. But I do love this trope. I think it's so funny that if a couple goes to get it on, it is a death sentence. You just know that that is like the mark of death. If Becky starts taking her clothes off, you literally know she's about to have her last moments. So Tommy better get her good before she gets taken out. I just think it's really funny. Obviously, it's like a weird slut shamey thing to like, and like sex negative thing to like say, if you go and have sex, then you're going to be murdered but I don't think it's that deep and it's such a classic horror trope like it's it's the lore at this point next up we have survival horror and for me this could go either way I have loved some survival horror like The Ruins one of my favorite books of all time but also like the movie Frozen oh my god not Frozen with the fucking singing snowman the other Frozen it's a horror movie it's survival horror out in the middle of this like snowy mountain three people get stranded on a ski lift and that is some of the most effective horror I have ever watched highly highly recommend that movie love survival horror when it's entertaining like those two examples but I've also sat through some extremely boring survival horror and that is uh to me a lot of like post-apocalyptic survival horror it just it doesn't hit for me I yeah, this is my list I can put things where I want abandoned buildings uh definitely pull me in anything that contributes to that isolated setting just heightens the horror I love an abandoned factory I love an abandoned field I love an abandoned church 
um, an abandoned home where a bunch of teenagers are going to throw a party and they get picked off one by one. Yeah, it's, it's a solid trope. Next up, we have the villain speech. Wah, wah. Yeah, literally die. I hate the villain monologue where the killer is pacing around explaining their motive before they make the final kill. To me, that's a really cheap trope and I just don't like the execution probably 90% of the time. I think a book especially should be able to explain to me the motives without having to spell them out. You know, show me, don't tell me kind of thing. And I think it speaks to a lack of writing skills. <laughs> and in a movie, it's just, it's just hard to watch. I don't think any actor is really going to deliver a villainous speech great unless it's like ironic and campy in something like Knives Out. So that's my two cents on the villain speech. Um, I hate it. Slashers, you know where this is gonna go. I love a slasher. Slashers are my favorite type of horror. I would rather read a slasher than anything else. I just love a bunch of teens running around, smoking weed, having sex, doing all the shit they're not supposed to do, and then masked killer comes out of the shadows to slash them all. Night of the Prowler by John Athan is phenomenal. I also love Camp Slaughter, which I mentioned, Clown in a Cornfield, just so much campy fun. A carnival setting, oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes! that's an auto buy for me as well. Wonderland by Jennifer Hillier. I love that one. Cotton Candy Massacre. Welcome to Smiley Land. All of these books I am obsessed with. Pretty much anything that has a carnival setting I'm gonna enjoy. There are just so many creative kills that can happen when a horror movie especially or a book is set at a carnival like you just kind of run out of ways to kill creatively when you've seen and read so many slashers so putting it in a carnival setting where you can kill someone using say a popcorn machine or a roller coaster it just makes it so much more fun to read next up we have witches and honestly, I know this is unpopular, especially for a queer woman like myself, but it just pushes me away. I am not interested by witches at all. American Horror Story Coven, I don't get the obsession. I'm sorry, I liked Freak Show a lot better. I know, I know, roast me in the comments, that's totally fine. Uh, I just don't love witches. It's not a lot of like on page horror that happens with witches. It's not a lot of like, ee, 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 or ooh, ooh, ooh. It's just like, doesn't hit for me. I'm sorry to all the witches out there. A creature feature, that that depends on the type of creature for me. Uh, something like The Monster in Stolen Tongues by Felix Blackwell. Oh my god, that little psychological element just put it over the top for me. I love a creature feature like that. But something like The Shuddering by Anya Alborn, that didn't quite hit for me. Uh, a lot of like just straight up animals or like mutant animals, that type of horror doesn't really hit for me either. Uh, a lot of those vintage paperbacks from hell kind of books that are creature features, I just <laughs> find it really hard to get into. But when you add that modern element, um, something like a psychological element on the creature, it really, really works. Oh my gosh, this next trope I think is so funny. We should all split up. Let's all go in different directions because that hasn't gone horribly in any other horror situation ever. Yeah, no, literally die. I hate when everyone splits up. I know that it signifies that the slashing is going to begin, so like I should like it, but it just makes me roll my eyes every time. Like. I wish that people could be separated and killed without all of the characters having to make this dumb decision of splitting up. Next we have curses. Uh, curses usually push me away, I would say. It, it takes a special type of curse <laughs> for me to enjoy it. I think if it's a cursed artifact, like something like the finding an artifact that's cursed, I can get behind it. But just a curse like placed on someone, I don't love. Again, I'm a gore girl and curses do not speak to gore. The final girl trope, auto buy. I love a final girl. 
any book that has Final Girl in the title, you can pretty much be sure I'm going to buy Final Girls by Riley Sager, Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix, The Last Final Girl by Stephen Graham Jones. I love all of that shit. Oh my gosh. Any self-aware horror that like plays on its own trope, like uses that as a plot device. I think it's so interesting, this type of like meta horror that's become a new genre. It feels like horror for horror lovers and uh, that's just like pandering to me. So I, I love it. Next up, we have a masked killer. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh. And that's an auto buy. <laughs> Can you tell why I buy so many horror books? Look at this auto buy section. It is crazy. Uh, I love a mass killer. I love the intrigue. Something about it. This is so embarrassing. Something about it is, dare I say, sexy. Like, you don't know who this man is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ridiculous. Uh, I just, I love a mass killer, okay? Like, the intrigue is just there. If I was the final girl running away, I might trip and fall on purpose just to see if like Mr. Whoever who's hunted me down is like worth my time. <laughs> oh God. I mean, look at Billy Loomis. That's all I'm saying. And next up we have cannibals. I love a good cannibal. That pulls me right on in. I love a cannibal moment. It's just so dark, so sinister. It brings the gore that I love to read about. It's not an auto buy because I've seen cannibal stuff done not well. Uh, and sometimes we get into that like gross side of body horror that I don't love. But for the most part, if I hear a story has cannibals, uh, pretty much sign me up. Did anyone else hear that? I'm alone in my house and something just fell. <gasps> Not while I'm filming a horror video. No, no, no. I'm terrified. Next up, we have an inbred family. And for me, this depends on the way that it's done. I love something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like the weird incest vibes, so terrifying, such effective horror. But I've also seen inbred tropes done in a very problematic way. Something like The Hills Have Eyes I am fine with, but wrong turn, you start to get into a place that just feels icky and it's not horror for horror's sake, it's horror that drags down a whole like population of people. And I'm not talking about inbred people because <laughs> What? No. Uh, I'm talking about like when inbred people are portrayed as like having these other disabilities that hurts the disabled community of, you know, other people that are not inbred that have these things. Uh, so I think it just depends on if you go about it in a problematic way or not. And finally, we have a killer clown. Hell yeah, that's an auto buy. Goes along with the whole carnival situation. I love a clown. It's that same like masked killer thing too. It, clowns kind of encapsulate a lot of what I love. Carnival setting, masked killer, usually they're slashing. Usually that means extreme gore. Like I just love a clown and you know what big feet mean? You know, they got those big ass clown shoes. <laughs> okay, we are approaching some edge of my weird mood that we're not going to go into anymore. So this is the final list. Get a good old look. We have a lot, lot, lot in the auto buy category, which I did not realize, <laughs> but I guess that's why I buy so many horror books. And I feel like the pulls me in and pushes me away categories, they were pretty predictable. The depends on the use, it, it really depends for me on if it's boring or problematic. If it can go one of those ways, it's, it's sketchy for me. And I'm a little surprised there's not too much in the literally die category. Only a villain speech and we should all split up. So I feel like those are just the dumb things that nobody wants to see anyway. So that is my final tier list of all 30 horror tropes that I talked about today. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you tomorrow for the next day of Vlogmas. Go ahead and like this video if you liked it and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Don't forget to go to therapy and read a book this week and I will see you in my next one. Bye!